start now. Um, this is the Game Design Live Chat. Um, I'm Carla Kopp. Um, I'm from Weird Draft Games. I'm a designer, developer, and publisher. Um, the Game Design Live Chats are just a live chat on a certain topic. Um, sometimes we have a guest, and that guest today is Emma Larkins. Um, the topic today is uh, designer branding and how to find a publisher. Um, so we'll start with Emma. Introduce yourself. Tell us why you're so amazingly awesome. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that, Carla. My name is Emma Larkins. I'm a board game designer, podcaster, streamer. You might have seen or heard me on the Udology or the Gen Con TV Twitch streams. I also do my own live board game design streams. Uh, my games include Heart Catchers and They Died, and most recently, a bin and all artichokes. Which is an amazing game that I'm so happy. Like, well, I played a couple versions of it, but like yeah. this version, uh, the published version, is by far the cutest version. I know. Uh, it's fun. I'm actually doing the design diary on BGG, so I went through all the tweets and stuff, and it was super heartwarming because Chad and Randy and you and all these people two one and two years ago just like this is such a good game. So it's fun. Um, really supported by the community. So it's been a fun process. So um, right now, if anyone else wants to introduce themselves and maybe say a game that they're designing right now, uh, you can do so. And just feel free to say your name. I'll say hi to Emma. Uh, how's it going? Hi, Charlie. It's uh, so good to see you. Yeah, you too. Um, yeah, Charlie McCarran. And I'm a designer. My main game right now is Four Humors. But... I'll hop in. I'm Matt Williams, uh, live in Columbus with, uh, with Steam Kitty Games, uh, currently working on O Relay, which is the cute Cthulhu collect, uh, cultist collecting card game, as another designer put it, and Otter Park. Nice. Uh, hi, I'm Ananda. I'm working on a couple different games right now. The one I'm most focused on is uh, Spelling Brawl, which is like a word fighting game. OK, last chance for introductions. And nobody I'll, has to. I'll Wait, do Connor. Right. <laughs> oh, Amari. Sure. Uh, Amari, two people. I'll go first. Do it. Uh, Hi, Amari. Hey. <laughs> Good to see you, Emma. Uh, Good to see you. Uh, I'm Omari Akil. And yeah, I'm working on a couple games right now to uh, I think the one that's most far along is, I think maybe now called Hoop Gods, which is about uh, street basketball. And that I'm also working on a little memory game that is interesting. I haven't done memory things before. So that one's going pretty well, but yeah, looking forward to working on that. Thanks. Hey, I'm Connor. I'm currently working on uh, the Newman Factory, like a rush hour style puzzly game. Um, yeah. I'm in the Bay Area. Okay, so let's start this off. And Emma, how would you define brand and why would you want a brand as a game designer? Oof. So brand can mean many different things. Most often people associate it with uh, companies. So a brand, you know, a lot of really recognizable thing. You think brand, I don't think about Nike or Adidas or all these different things. Like big companies have been doing this for years and years. So when you first think about brand, that's probably what's going to come to mind. When I talk about branding as a game designer, what I mean is personal branding. And in some ways it is kind of connected to those big company brands, but it's a lot more about uh, when a company does it, they have a very focused vision and they have a product and they're trying to sell. It's very business-like. When a person does it, it's much more about uh, sharing about yourself, about being part of the community, about communicating your values and kind of just, I guess, putting your best face forward and having a public face that you can use to interact with people and something that's recognizable to people. Okay. Uh, what difficulties have you had with branding? <laughs> oh gosh, right to the hard one. Uh, 
So I talk a lot about personal branding and uh, I, I do weird stuff. You know, I dye my hair pink, uh, very visible online, very uh, vocal at conventions, go to a lot of conventions. And I, I worry sometimes that I make it look easy. I don't know, or that people look at that and they think, oh, I could never do those kinds of things. Uh, so I wanted to talk about this question because uh, it hasn't always been easy. And I think that um, I like to be honest and vulnerable about it because other people can look at that and say like, oh, maybe that is something I can do. So for example, uh, a lot of people are shocked when they hear this, but I used to be incredibly, incredibly shy. Uh, it's something that I've actually worked on incredibly hardly over, uh, incredibly hard over the years. And so people, I know a lot of people in the industry, a lot of designers uh, are more on the introverted side of the spectrum than the extro extroverted side. Uh, and I just, I like to share this part of my background because it's definitely something, uh, it's not easy. It takes a lot of time to kind of put yourself out there, but if you can put yourself out there in a way that kind of makes yourself comfortable, take baby steps. It's definitely, it's not something like a, um, you are, you aren't, it's not a dichotomy, you know, it's something, it's a progression and something that you can learn and work on. Well, I definitely second, um, <laughs> right? that, uh, uh, probably all of that, like one with yeah. the hair color, um, after I dyed my hair, one, everyone had to relearn who I was because I was completely unrecognizable for, uh, several conventions, which was interesting because <laughs> I didn't change anything else um, yeah. about myself. But once I did the hair change, then I was started being super recognizable. Um, so if you are capable of doing this to yourself, uh, it is super great as a brand. Um, but also, um, I try to talk a lot about my anxiety because, well, like I am just one huge ball of anxiety most days. Um, but I found in talking about it and making it more normal to do so it helps out a lot of people yeah um, so yeah like oh just like uh i i talk about it probably too much because well especially now because like who is not full of anxiety with a <laughs> pandemic going on i mean Fair. what yeah um, but but like when you're like oh yeah like you are agreeing like it, it makes everyone just feel so much better yeah Yeah, and even still, these days, like, uh, just a lot of overthinking and doing shows, even podcast episodes, Udology, I've been doing it for a year now, and, like, right before we hit record, it would just, like, hit me in the face, and something, you just be like, I'm gonna go there, or a talk, like, doing talks at PAX, or those kinds of things, just sitting there and looking out and being like, oh my gosh, I'm actually here, <laughs> this is really intense. Oh, yeah, like, uh, well, even before this, so, like, uh, we usually, like, there's some people that are here beforehand, and we talk and stuff, and, like, if anyone ever asked me, like, how are you doing, I'm like, oh, I'm alive, I'm here, <laughs> because, like, it's like, oh, my gosh, this is starting in five minutes, and then when yeah. it starts, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm just talking with people I know, this is perfectly fine, yeah, like, yeah. like there's just uh, something with your brain, where it's, like, your brain, like, there's so much hype and stuff before things start, but then when you're in it, you're just in it. And it's like, this is, this is fine. This is just normal. Like, um, I mean, it would be more normal if we were all like in the same room, just hanging yeah. out at the table, <laughs> but um, this is the next best thing. Yeah. Usually the fear is much worse than the actual thing. That's what I've learned. Mm -hmm. um, so with branding, mm -hmm. how do I get started? All right. Uh, I love this thing. Uh, again, there's people look at, you know, at a big company or at someone they respect in the industry who's doing amazing things and they look at their body of work and everything they do on a daily basis and like, oh, that person's so cool. They're so visible, so recognizable. I can never do that. But the thing is, you can. And all of us who have any level of notoriety started out where you are. So I've been on Twitter and I like to talk about Twitter a lot because I think that's kind of, that's where I spend a lot of my time. So just using that as an example, uh, I just checked, I started in 2008. So I've been using Twitter for 12 years. And over the course of that, 
when I started out, I wasn't even in games. I was doing online writing and then I was doing fiction writing and I was connecting with people. But I kind of just, I didn't know where I was going to go either. Like I didn't know if writing was going to be my thing. I didn't know my, my grand plan, what my goal was. I just started putting stuff up there, putting links to things, writing samples, connecting with people, uh, anything that I was doing in my daily life. And you'll even see this now if you follow me on Twitter, if it's cooking something or taking a picture of a game. What I really want to encourage people in order to make this a sustainable thing is just do what makes you happy and do what makes you comfortable. A lot of people hear marketing and they think of it as a bad word and they think they have to suffer in order to market. But I think the most important marketing, especially when it comes to personal branding, is just, you know, whatever is fun for you. If you like to sing or do a little animation, the example I always come back to is if you like to knit tea cozies with that are board game themed, you know, you can send those to people or take pictures of them, whatever really speaks to you. Uh, just start doing, like you're already doing those things that are fun and enjoyable for you. So the next step is sharing, you know, just take a quick picture of it, post it online. Don't worry too much about in the beginning, especially what people are going to think about it. Just kind of take a little more time and effort to share those parts of yourself that are meaningful with a broader audience. So do you have any very specific things that beginners could do? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> just checking my notes here. Cause again, the preparation thing, I don't just come here and know everything I want to say. I have like all my list of things that I want to make sure that I cover. All right. So for specific beginner tips, if you're just getting started, uh, I think most people, if not everyone here is in the board game industry, looking to brand yourself in the board game space, probably as a designer. But when you're doing your personal branding, it doesn't have to be 100% tied to board games. In fact, I think a lot of the most recognizable people in the industry uh, have other things going on in addition to board games. And those things will make you it would make you appear as a more well-rounded human. You know, it's not meant to be exactly manipulative like that, but people want to see, they want to know about you and know about your passions. And if you're just doing, you know, kind of pure dry board game stuff without personality to it, that can be a little bit boring sometimes. Uh, next tip is consistency. This is the biggest thing. If you can just make a commitment once a week, you know, on Saturdays and Sundays, if you can do, you know, every time I make a new prototype, I'm going to take a picture, any uh, system you can get into to make this a consistent practice is really going to help. Like it matters a lot less what you're actually posting as much as it matters that you're doing it on a regular basis. Um, again, what you're passionate about, you know, you're going to stick with it if it's something that you actually care about and enjoy. Uh, be generous with your time and attention. Personal branding is a lot about community. Uh, people are going to support you and care about you if you support and care about them. And again, not in a manipulative way, but if you actually enjoy <laughs> people. Again, Carly, you said talking with your friends. I feel like I'm friends with a lot of people in the industry, and that's not something I did in order to get somewhere. It's just I really love a lot of people in this industry. And I love supporting them, raising them up, sharing the stuff they're working on. Um, so that's a really great way to build and support your personal brand. Uh, and the last tip I have is to stay positive. I know as much as you can. Again, we're in a pandemic. It's important to be vulnerable and share things about yourself that aren't always positive. But it's really tough to build a functioning brand around negativity. And I know a lot of people get a lot of traction and are very well known for constant negative behavior, um, personal branding on social media, wherever. Uh, and it can be a brand, but it's, it's harder, especially if you want to share your brand with publishers, you know, if you're the kind of person just like doom and gloom all the time, then it can be hard to, build a sustainable community and a community you want to be part of, right? Like the, if you're positive, if you give out positive energy, you'll receive positive energy. So it's very back and forth flow there. 
So uh, I don't think I was trying to do that, but I was kind of doing branding. Um, so with my like brand, um, a lot of people on Twitter know that I love dinosaurs. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. 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 Like I, could, I probably could have just like said like, what does Carla love? Um, because yeah. um, at this point in time, I get tagged like um, at least once a week, if not more than that, with something that is dinosaur, giraffe, or okapi related. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes just random animals because people know that <laughs> I love like the random weird animals. Um, but like uh, the draft thing is not it wasn't intentional because um, my my company Weird Draft Games is based off of No Copy, which no one knows. Um, <laughs> but board gamers know more of it because I talk about it so much. Um, but because of that, like people will like see a dinosaur thing and be like, Carla. Um, well, because I like. As Emma said, like I am just really passionate about dinosaurs. I yeah. mean, you have a game design that doesn't have a theme yet? Make it dinosaurs. It'll be fun. It'll be fun yeah. that way. Best <laughs> game ever. Um, yeah. But like, I'm able to just talk about that. Like, if you wanted to talk about dinosaurs for two hours, I can do that. Like, <laughs> we should do that as a like chat in the future. Like, let's make a dinosaur game because like yeah. that will be the best hour of my life. Yeah, and just um, go deep into the dinosaur part of it. It's just off the rails, all dinosaurs. All dinosaurs all the time. <laughs> but, like, just choose something that you could just, you could do that. You could just talk for five hours on and you will be that person that is about dinosaurs or whatever. And like, it'll be such a positive thing because then you'll also find other people that like that thing. Um, also, one of my like other things that I really like that I talk about kind of frequently is time travel. But like, mm finding those people that are also like let's talk about how time travel works um it you get like such great moments in addition to the whole branding thing like because like as emma said there's like a lot of positive like marketing reasons to do this but there's also all the other positives that are like that just make your life better like finding yeah. all these great friends <laughs> yeah, marketing done well. And I hate using the word marketing. It is the correct term for it. But again, it's people have such ne negative associations with it. And if done correctly, yeah, it's talking about stuff you love and making friends and helping other people make cool things. All of that comes together to make you be known as a person who represents those things, which you probably want anyways. So. Um, would you say that um, people would have to brand as a game designer? It, I mean, it's not necessary. I'm sure everyone has examples in their mind of well-known designers who don't spend a lot of time branding. You'll see their names on boxes, but you never really see them on social media, and you don't see them do, doing a lot of podcasts and things. So it's tough because when I say like, oh, you know, branding as a designer is really important. If you say, well, these super famous people didn't do it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but as the board game industry becomes more competitive, and I use that word with a grain of salt because I really don't think that we're competing against each other. But there is definitely, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's more designers than ever before. Branding gives you an edge. So I love to use this example if... <laughs> So I want to say like the quality of games is getting better and better too. So you might be making amazing games. But there's a lot of other people making amazing games at the same time. So if you and another designer submit your two amazing games to the publisher at the same time, the designer with the brand and with the platform is probably going to get chosen. If the games mechanically uh, in terms of quality are pretty close, platform gives them an edge and it's something that the publisher can lean on and can rely on to help make their game successful. So if you're already well known in the community, if you're uh, sharing your stuff and they know when your game's published, your reach is going to get to a bunch of people who they might not be able to reach, it's another factor of value that you can offer to a publisher. Uh, and this is if you're working with a publisher. If you're self-publishing, then I would say it's pretty much essential to have a personal brand. A lot of people think, well, I'm just going to make a good game, put it up on Kickstarter, whatever. You know, I'm just going to, if the game is good enough, it will speak for itself. That's less and less the case in a crowded 
landscape. Having that platform and that brand is really going to help support all the hard work that you've done on designing the game. So I would go even further, like, uh, so I, I am a publisher, um, and if I have two games in front of me, and one is by a designer that I've never interacted with before, and they're not on Twitter, um, and the other one is one from uh, a designer that I have talked to because I go to conventions, and I'm on Twitter and Facebook and all these things, I like, even if the designer who is on Twitter, like, if their game is worse, I... I still might go with the worst game. Because, <laughs> yeah, you go. Yeah, it's um, true. This truth. Like, this is just a fact. Because, like, um, if I know nothing about you and I've never interacted with you um, and you haven't gone in any interviews and stuff, like, uh, with games, like, one, publishers develop games. Like, the games that you buy off the shelf, that is not just the work of the designer. Oh my like, gosh, no. Most of the time. So uh, <laughs> I am fully capable as a developer to develop a game into what the product that it needs to be. Um, but having somebody else that is willing to like go on interviews and be out there and will just make the game like more popular because just having a Twitter account, I would say if you're a game designer and you don't have a Twitter account, you should not even try to get your games published with small publishers. Like, harsh, harsh, but true. Yeah. <laughs> well, because um, what a Twitter account says to me is that you are willing to join a community and interact with other people. Yeah. Um, because I am a publisher where if I sign your game, I want to work with you. Like I want to collaborate back and forth. Um, and one way of showing that you are capable of like interacting as a human in a community is interacting as a human in a community. Like choose something. Like if you're not into Twitter, um, be on one of the um, Facebook groups or be like really engaged in your local community. Like I know Emma also runs a big play testing group. Um, so I know that Emma is very much capable. Like even if I didn't know anything else about her, knowing that she runs her own play testing group and the group is like what 50 people that tells me that she gets along with at least 50 people. So, <laughs> well, I mean, if you're going by the Facebook metrics, it's like 300 something, but yeah, for the, the regular core group, definitely around 50 people. And it's like the it's you're making a, a relationship when you're working with a publisher, it's a relationship, it's a business relationship, sometimes also a personal relationship and you have to work with this person. Like can you imagine people send their games off to people and and I've done this too, send them off to publishers and you know, the is the publisher going to want to work with someone they don't know at all? Like would you hire someone to work for your company if you didn't know them at all. That's what the whole interview process is for. Uh, and that's why often when you're working with a publisher, you'll go back and forth for months and years, especially if you're not as well known in the industry because they have to see like, are is this person willing to have that back and forth with me? Are they going to push back on a lot of stuff that I'm saying? Are they gonna be good to work with? Are they gonna be positive? Are they gonna be enjoyable? To work with and you can see a lot of this if you're being uh, honest and visible on social media and in conventions where wherever it is that you are people will kind of get a sense for what kind of a person you are and what kind of person you would be to work with and like carla said that's uh everything great amazing examples it's when especially as a small publisher taking a risk on a person you want to have a sense of this person's personality Uh, does anyone else have some questions? I do. Um, I was just wondering, uh, um, this whole uh, idea of, of, of personal branding, how much how much of it is, is planned versus how much of it is just something that because you're being you know true to yourself and to what you're you're passionate about, just ends up becoming sort of recurring theme uh, um, that you just end up going with the flow on. Did that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, I think it goes back and forth for me personally. So when I started out, you know, I was just doing whatever, kind of feeling my way through. And there's been times when I've relied more on just the just my natural <laughs> expressions. You know, what am I feeling like today? 
I think if you want to get more serious about it, uh, and again, this one thing I didn't mention in the beginning of the chat is a lot of this depends on your goals as a designer. If, and this is work too. And I realized that saying a lot of this stuff is, you know, adding extra stuff. Everyone's very busy. So it's, uh, it, it's kind of like, don't try to do it all at once and do as much as makes sense for yourself as a person, one thing I did a couple of years ago, and I'm still doing it to some extent, is this idea of game design daily. So I gave myself a challenge every day to do a little thing that was related to game design to help me improve as a game designer. And most of those things, I wanted them to also be content. So if I was writing a list of alliterative game design names, which is where Ben and All Artichokes came from, I posted a picture of that on Twitter. Uh, if I was making a prototype, I posted a picture of that on Twitter. Even if I was just um, reading a book or reading a couple pages from a book or watching a YouTube video about game design, I would make a little note about that and share it. And having done that for, I think I did it for daily or almost daily for a little over a year. And that really did help to solidify my practice. I've also been <laughs> a marketing manager in the past. So I had to do this for other companies where it was very much, you know, like, oh, what am I gonna tweet today? What am I gonna share today? I've been a social media uh, marketing person. So I do have a lot of experience with this, but it depends a lot on what kind of person you are. For most people, I think giving yourself a challenge or a little bit of a structure, like I'll post every Monday. And again, keep the bar super low if you're getting started out, you don't wanna overwhelm yourself but having um, a system to it, building a habit around it, I think I would say, can make it a lot easier to keep that consistency that's so important. Um, so one of the things I read when I started like uh, all of this game design thing is that uh, I initially read Jamie Stegmeier's, um, like his whole blog. Um, but one of the things that really uh, kept with me were um, that he wrote this thing that was a 10 daily actions to build your crowd. Like just do these 10 things a day. They can be really simple and easy. Um, I posted the link in there, but um, yeah, like I think like scheduling them in, make sure that they get done. Like uh, the things that Emma was talking about, like were things that she was doing anyway, but having that reminder to post it um that i think like having that in your schedule like however you do it like uh, i use todoist so in my todoist every day it tells me to tweet um mm. and most of the time by the time i get to that action item in my list i've already tweeted so i just cross it off but mm. if i haven't i you know i go and i tweet because it's like a reminder like oh yeah yeah like this thing exists um so i really think like uh, just having like a list like a to-do list like that every day like until it becomes like a natural part of your day of just like, oh yeah, I take pictures of things and I share them with people or I help out or I do whatever. Like uh, one of the other things I did when I started out was um, like just offer to read rules for people. So like mm. every week or every two weeks, I just post on Twitter and be like, hey, anyone that wants somebody to read their rules, I know English and I'm a capable human and that's all I <laughs> Like, you know, I wasn't like saying like, I'm not an editor or anything like that. Um, mm. But like, we all can probably, I hope that we can read a language. Um, so uh, you could offer that up as a thing. And, you know, that that's what really, I think, was one of the things that got me started. Because like, w well, one, offering to read people's rules, they need that a lot. But um, it also teaches you a lot of things. Oh, but, yeah. Um, I made a lot of friends early on that way. Oh, um, I imagine, yes, reading people's rules, that's like God tier of community participation. Well, and it's so easy, cause it's like, I don't have to have special skills. I just need to like tell them when I got confused. Yeah, yeah, that's easy. like, that's, I get confused all the time, right? So yeah. just like, God, I'm so confused here and here and here. Uh, and again, I think we're saying all this stuff and it's, um, daily reminders, like both of us are professionals in the industry. So this is something that we are very focused on. As you're getting started, um, depending on your level of commitment to it, it's kind of like, it's like exercise or anything that you wanna get better at. How much effort you're gonna put into it depends on how much, how tied you are to achieving that goal. And if your goal is 
to become a published designer or to build your brand, whatever your goal is, the more focus you do, the faster, probably there's some luck involved, the faster you'll get there, but you need to balance, right? Everything in your life, um, does this make sense? Is it fun? And again, if you can find things that you enjoy, Carla, I don't know how much you enjoyed reading those rules, but it was something that made sense to you, or you probably didn't hate it too much, you know, if you kept doing it. Yeah, I mean, it. honestly, like reading a rule book, it takes like, I don't know, five, 10 minutes, and then it's over. So, yeah. Like, uh, well, how I try to like, look at everything in my life is like, not how much do I enjoy this? But like, what is the benefit of me doing this? Like, well, one, the benefit is that somebody else gets to like, have their rules proofread. And like, we do like that whatever the handshake thing like usually people are like oh yeah i'll read your rules back and then it's like yes somebody will, will read mine yeah um, but then like you also get to like just learn like yep. you get to learn either different mechanics and how people do them or like um you learn how you don't like rules laid out or people that do like certain special things like after reading so many rule books i know exactly like how i like rule books to be laid out nice so yeah like, if you keep doing something, you you can learn from basically anything. Like, even if it's just, like, oh, you're going to help somebody prototype something or lay it out or whatever. Like, I learned how to cut prototypes super fast because I cut out a lot of prototypes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, like Matt says in the chat, uh, playtesting is a great example. If you playtest other people's games, you become a better game designer. For my community that I run long stretches of time, months at a time, I haven't had any games to bring, but because I'm the organizer, kind of got to keep showing up and it's super fun. Like we're all friends in the group, so it's very enjoyable. So like you said, I get to see friends and hang out with people in the before times. So now it's all digital, but still super valuable to connect with people. I get to see what other people are doing on games. Maybe I get my game tested, but that's kind of like down here, you know, just seeing what other people are doing is very valuable. I often feel like I learn more from testing other people's games than I do from testing my own games. So um, do you ever have to do like a certain thing? Like, do you ever have to have a Twitter or an Instagram mm -hmm. or like, if you don't like one thing, do you have to have it? Uh, absolutely not. So we, we, we did say Twitter. <laughs> I think Carla and I would both agree that this is a great place to be. What I like about Twitter specifically definitely has its problems, but it's a more public thing and it's easier to share. Uh, very easy just to retweet something or like something, um, tag other people in it too. With uh, Facebook and Instagram, it's a little harder to get that viral effect. Um, with Instagram, it's very hard to share other people's posts. You can share Facebook, but it's a little trickier to get that like, oh, so many people have shared that, the kind of ripple effect. Uh, so that's why I like using Twitter. But you really Again, I think people have built very big audiences completely on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitch. You know, there's a lot of people who are just on Twitch and that's the only place that they are. It's much more important that, again, it won't always feel comfortable. It won't always make you happy or smile like, oh my gosh, I'm going to post on Twitter today. I'm so excited. Uh, it won't always bring you joy, but something that you don't hate, I think is the best thing. Like if you hate... Um, selfies. I know a few people who don't like taking pictures of themselves. It's tough for me because I love seeing all y'all's faces. So I definitely support that. But some people don't feel comfortable with that. Or some people don't feel comfortable um, with doing a lot of video stuff, uh, doing live stuff. If there's things like definitely challenge yourself and push yourself to see if maybe eventually that can be a place you can go. But for your core of where you spend your most time, you want it to feel not terrible, right? If you're just suffering through this social media and you're doing something over and over again that you really don't enjoy, then that's a sign that you're probably not going to stick with it. And yeah, you shouldn't have to suffer for, for, for doing it. And also, uh, secondary to that, don't sweat the details. When I got started, again, 2008, right? The internet was a different place, all about backlinking and you had to post your site to all these different places and you had to go on the forums and share it there. And there's all this weird 
like Google hack stuff going on, which might still be a thing. I'm not doing SEO anymore, thank God. Um, but anyone, people will say like, oh, well, you got to tweet at this time of the day, or you have to attach a picture. Now we're doing videos. There's a lot of things that come and go that are the, the min maxer techniques to get the most traction on whatever platform that you're doing. And for the most part, that's just like, look at your own experience. If you tweet, I sometimes tweet at like one o'clock in the morning Pacific time, and it just goes into the nether world. And I'm like, well, maybe I should schedule a tweet in TweetDeck instead of just tweeting what I'm thinking if I care about people seeing it. So you can kind of lean into your own experience, but unless until you get just a super huge platform, a lot of that optimization stuff is not going to matter. Mm -hmm. Well, and another thing, like, so say that you hate all social media all the time and you've tried it and it just doesn't work. Um, one thing you could look for in a co-designer is finding somebody that is willing to do the things. And if you offer to do something that they hate, like, say you will do, like, you will cut every prototype all the time <laughs> and they don't have to cut anything ever. Yeah. Maybe they'll do all the social media for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's... uh co-designing and m m finding people to support the parts of yourself that you're not as excited about. Uh, and I think that's, again, try and push yourself a little bit if you're just getting uh, started out. Maybe you don't have a co-designer yet because you haven't been connecting with people. But when your goals, if, you know, if it really comes down to it and this is you really just want to spend your time making games, you just don't you feel super drained by the energy of promoting and sharing things then if you do that for a little bit and just build up a little bit of a platform maybe get a publisher who will take care of a lot of that um yeah you can get to the point where you where someone else does a, a lot of that effort for you again if you give them something that's very valuable <laughs> <laughs> the, the carpal tunnel from endless card cutting. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's real. Yeah, it's um, real. So uh, for Tessa asked, um, how do you feel about designer diaries as a way to build brand or self-motivate? <laughs> oh, this is, <laughs> you don't know if this is kind of a deep cut because I've been working on my designer diary for Manuel Artichokes for like a month longer than I was supposed to. I was supposed to have it out like a month ago, but then the pandemic happened. So I feel a little bit justified with that because everything has been crazy. Um, I, I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. And I think that that is a type of content that a lot of people will feel comfortable with if they don't feel comfortable being a little more like sharing more personal things about themselves, sharing their design process can be something that feels very natural. Uh, and to this end, <laughs> well, it's funny, actually, because I'm going to come back to Twitter. So as I work on my Abandon All Artichokes design diary, I search Twitter for Abandon All Artichokes. And from the very first time that I posted that list of alliterative game names, it's all on Twitter. So it's actually been fantastic because I don't remember half of the stuff that happened during the development process of this. And you're not going to remember. So whatever it is, if you post your process live on Twitter, it's been great for me. I have two whole years of play tests and conventions. And Carla, like I said, you and other friends talking about being excited about this game. Uh, so it's a great way to build up content to make a design diary. Or else take notes. Uh, if you have your paper notebooks, you can go back and refer to those. Even just, um, I like to encourage people to start rules docs very early. So as early as possible, just make some notes about how the game plays. And at the same time, you can either in the same or another document, just make some notes, you know, like this state, I did this play test, this is the general reaction, uh, almost like a diary, I guess. Diary really does make sense because people will love to see that, you know, once the game comes out, seeing kind of your dark night of the soul when it got really hairy for you, when you were really happy during the process, when you pivoted from penguins to dinosaurs because your publisher wanted dinosaurs. So that's what the game is going to be now. Um, yeah. And then you can, the design diary becomes content that you can put on YouTube or put on your blog or BGG is where I'm working on my design diary. So yeah, absolutely. It's a great way to uh, share yourself as a designer.
Yeah, I agree. I've done design diaries for all of my published games. And I mean, it's nice um, because like, like going back and like actually writing them, I've learned a lot just going over like, oh yeah, like uh, for Tumbletown, we were going to do these uh, designer interview things. Um, and we went over and like, initially I was like, yeah, there's been like three versions of this game, right? Yeah. Um, but then like listing out all the versions, it's like, oh, there's there's 10 versions. There were 10 <laughs> very distinct versions and I forgot about all of them. Yeah. But like getting it all together, like at the end, like you, you can learn a lot as a designer. Like, oh, okay, well, this is why we transitioned from one to two for this reason and then two to three and like you can learn a lot yourself um and if you are learning about just writing down what you experienced like you experienced that once and now you're experiencing it again as you write it down like um so anyone else could also probably learn from that and doing anything like good for the community is also great <laughs> it can also be great emotionally the uh and this it's like Stay tuned for my Ben All Our Jokes design diary where I go into the emotionally wrenching journey of waiting for a publisher to say yes to your game. Because looking back on it now, I'm like, oh, it wasn't that long. But I remember just months and months of agonizing over, because I was talking to Game Riot about it and I was really excited about it, but they were being very poker face and I didn't know if they really wanted to publish it. Although Jason told me later, he was like, oh yeah, we knew from the beginning that we, this was probably going to be something we done. I'm like, you, I didn't know that. I was just like on the edge of my seat, like in the agony of will this game ever work? I, I broke the game, right? And I'm like, will I ever fix this game? It's broken now and I can't go back to where it was. So it can be very interesting. And then you're, at the end, you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. And you look back, you're like, oh, right. I was very stressed out during that. So you're just honoring and recognizing your uh, design journey, your mechanical journey, and your emotional journey. So um, say that you've been doing the, the Twitter or whatever, like your social media thing that you're mm -hmm. doing, um, but you're not like seeing the results that you want what should you do next? Yeah. So again, I'm making it sound easy. I'm like, oh, just do some tweets, post some pictures, do some stuff, and you'll have a million followers. It's, again, it's very crowded out there. It's very noisy, both in meat space and in digital space. There's a lot of people vying for everyone's attention. So yeah, you're going to do this for a while and you probably aren't going to see a lot of results right away. Like I said, for, I've been doing this Twitter specifically for 12 years and it's not, it wasn't until like two years ago that I really started to get traction with it. Uh, and that's say, 10 years, right? Doing this for 10 years until I finally started to build something up and I wasn't consistent. I like took months off here or a year off here. So if you want that to happen a little bit faster, some of the things you can do, again, consistency uh, for posting. If you can do it on a regular basis, then that will definitely help you. The more frequently, the better. Uh, focus is a thing. And coming back to difficulties, this has always been a little tough for me. I know the people who can be super focused about what their vision is and about what their personal brand is tend to be a little bit more successful. Again, if that's dinosaurs, right? Or if that's um, just music videos or whatever it is that people kind of latch onto and get very excited about and you get focused about that. If you're the kind of person who can focus on a thing, that can be very helpful for you. Uh, experimentation is good too. As I mentioned, I experimented quote unquote with posting at one o'clock in the morning Pacific time and it didn't work out so great. So if you are trying certain things like a text only post or like a a thread on Twitter or a video on Facebook, whatever it is, kind of try and pay attention to the results. Uh, I'm very analytics focused, very data focused. Uh, again, you can get too obsessive about that, but pay at least a little bit of attention. You know, if I posted this time versus this time, uh, this day versus this day, if I do a picture versus text, you can kind of just have in the back of your mind, um, at least like Twitter's got great analytics for this kind of stuff. It'll give you a lot of this data in a very handy, uh, if you go to the analytics page, it has a very handy breakdown of how everything is performing. Um, 
Last but not least, again, give back to the community. This was the hugest thing over the years, uh, above and beyond anything else, is just reaching out to people, saying hi to them, responding to their posts. Wow, I'm really excited about this thing. Can you tell me more? I just backed your Kickstarter. I just um, contributed to your Patreon, right? I love listening to your, your podcast. Uh, here, I have some questions. Like, what would you do in this scenario? Are you gonna be at this convention? Just the, it's a two-way street, right? So uh, again, be genuine about it. Don't just reach out to a million people and kind of spam people. Uh, but if you could just be out there, be active, be supportive of people, that's really going to help you leverage all the other work that you're doing with your branding. Yeah, like it doesn't take that much effort just to be nice to somebody else, just yeah. to say like a nice sentence. Um, but it can be super meaningful to somebody else, like just by like you see somebody else that, like posting about something that happened happy that happened to them just say congrats or you know say something nice um, yeah it's super easy um but it can go a long way and it, like uh, think about it more as like making the world a better place like make sure that what you do online is like uh you do way more positive than negative yeah yeah and uh, like uh, you mentioned carla tweeting every day which is super important uh I do want a caveat. <laughs> you can definitely spend a lot of time scrolling through Twitter obsessively. So be careful about that. Using lists and things can really help protect against that. But one thing I like to do is go through like tweets from a bunch of people. If like I have people who aren't as active or don't have as big community, so they have a tweet that I really like and doesn't have any likes yet, I like that. You know, I just like give it give a little heart on that because I think if you see something and it connects with you in any way. Like sometimes we just scroll past like, haha, that's kind of funny. And you keep scrolling, like give, give it a heart, you know, even and it responding too. so many of us are posting all the time and we never get a response to what we're doing. So if somebody has a tweet with two likes to it. It's like, oh, I just bought my new house. It's like, oh, that's awesome. Congratulations or emoji, heart, smiley face or whatever it is, you know, just that little bit of effort to acknowledge that other people exist. Um, good for marketing as kind of like, yeah, that's fine. It's good for marketing, but making the world a better place, right? Mm -hmm. and like, uh, <laughs> uh, so one thing I also do is like, uh, choose your own emoji. Be different. Like, uh, I like the dinosaur emojis. So like, mm -hmm. I'll just respond to things like, well, like if I'm super tired and don't have a lot of effort, it'll be like yeah. dinosaur, dinosaur, dinosaur. <laughs> and they understand what I feel. Like if they yeah. know me, they're like, oh yeah, this, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> That's like like a five dinosaurs is Carla's top level of approval. It's not stars. It's not hearts. It's just the dinosaur emoji. You're like, this is a dinosaur emoji. Oh my gosh. This is my, the best day ever. Oh, uh, so uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to do them. Um, oh, this is a good one. Uh, how do I know that branding is working? Uh, it comes again back to the the analytics, um, and I say analytics is a big scary word. There's, you can get very deep into it, but even just on your Twitter, how many likes are you getting? How many retweets? How many comments on things? Again, you don't want to get super obsessed with this. I've definitely gone down that rabbit hole of like, oh, I I crafted this tweet for two hours, and this is my magnum opus of a tweet, and it got like three likes. Like, what is happening here? And kind of obsessing and pulling your hair out, and you're like, oh, I streamed my cat for ten minutes, and everyone's like, oh my gosh, that's the best thing I've ever seen. So it's really hard to um, manage a lot of things. Very easy to fall in a trap here, but for you know, over time, like you're starting to get more interactions. I think. I worry a little less about just straight up likes, you know, because it's kind of can be a little bit of a vanity metric and more about interaction, more about responses. Are people replying to the stuff that you're putting out there? Are they just um, mentioning you on Twitter, right? Like, oh, we, we had a great play test today and here are all the people who were there. If you start to get noticed and recognized. Uh, in general, if people are following you. It's a good sign that you're putting stuff out there. Again, that's meaningful to you and that you care about, but also what value are you providing? I think is an important thing that we haven't really discussed yet. It's not just, 
oh, this is what I care about. This is meaningful to me. It's how are you, um, you know, is this tweet, is it made someone laugh? Is the value it's entertainment or humor quality? Is it very thoughtful? You know, are you giving people a lot of stuff to think about? Are you providing advice that's really shareable for people? Um, all of these factors, you can kind of see um, people starting to respond to the stuff that you're putting out into the world. And I mean, if you like find that you don't know what to do, if you have a cat or a dog, <laughs> put your prototype with the cat, you know, take a picture. People will love it. Like, yeah, I mean, you so can uh, definitely go to those old stalwarts, like the fallbacks. There's you see the stuff and some people are very against popular things or memes. But again, you got to bite the bullet sometimes and kind of do some of the, the stuff that feels a little corny or just like not cool or unique, you know, just follow the crowd a, a little bit. I think I, uh, I, I just love adorable things, you know, baby seals and kittens and puppies. I can't help it. You know, I see that picture and I'm just here and it makes me happy in my heart. And I like and share that stuff because I want other people to share in that the happiness, that joy. So um, the next question is from, I think, Charlie, um, who said, uh, what's the mindset of publishers right now with cons and everything getting canceled? Are they going to be receptive to game pitches? And if so, what's the best way to meet them virtually? Uh, I have some thoughts here. Do you want to start with the publisher perspective or do you want me to start? Um, I can start from my perspective. Mm. Well, I can do from both because I am both. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, as a publisher, um, honestly, meeting at cons, like uh, meeting organically at cons was the best thing for me. Um, I never had much, uh, I don't know, uh, greatness happened from like a, or um, setting up pitch meetings with people I didn't know. Um, so I'll be doing about the same thing. Like you could still like submit games to me virtually. Like um, I'm much more open actually now to uh, doing videos and video chatting because that's, that's what it is. Um, but if you have like a tabletop simulator or a tabletopia implementation and I don't have to um, like if you say like when you're emailing me like, Hey, I have my prototypes on tabletopia and we can, Skype and I will teach you how to play like saying those things like say it's basically saying like hey I want to make it super easy for you to learn my game and say yes to me um mm. essentially so like if you have all those things and if you include like a uh, different video links like uh I always like having like uh the 30 second video because one I like me as a person as I hate watching videos um I have a video watcher like, I officially, like, for any review that is a video, I send it to my video watcher, and I make them, like, give me a quote and stuff. Nice. So, uh, yes. I like that. Uh, so, uh, I will completely ignore all your videos that are super long. Um, and super long can be, like, even five minutes. But a 30-second video, I am much more likely to watch. But, like, mm. other publishers super love videos, which is why you should probably have like a 30 second, like a three to five minute one, and like a longer, like maybe half hour playthrough if your game is super long, um, mm -hmm. so that everyone can like do the thing that they want. And also like having a website as well, like here, look at this website. You could see people having fun playing this Play game. game. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, before uh, you move on too much, one last thing is gifts. I actually stole this from the video game industry because they, they do this all the time. Uh, and this is how I got game rights attention was I actually put gifts of in a man of order chokes, you drive, draw five, five cards and they win the game. It's so like draw, 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 thumbs up. That was the gif. So if you can make a good gif of your game. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, and so anyone can make a good gif because if you have PowerPoint, anyone can do PowerPoint, right? It's just, you know, bring like moving around boxes and stuff. Uh, you can export you can make videos with PowerPoint and export and make it into a GIF. And that's what I do for Kickstarter pages. Ah, oh, I didn't know that. It's next level tips. I love it. So, I mean, we learned in PowerPoint in like high school, right? That's like yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So the publishing perspective, uh, were you done there? 
or I didn't want to jump on you if you were. Uh, I think you can go start talking. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's definitely a weird time, but I've all of the publishers I'm kind of keeping my eye on because again, it's another great thing about Twitter. Like you watch their tweets, you see them on Facebook, uh, join their groups, see everything that they're up to. It's not stalking because it's public. <laughs> Don't be a stalker. Uh, but yeah, I, a lot of the people I've had conversations with are just moving ahead like normal. I haven't really had a lot of people say that they're not doing stuff. I've still seen a lot of the contests. Um, I'm still actively pitching to people. Honestly, the whole tabletop simulator digital thing, I think is going to be kind of a, a revolution for our industry. And I've been meaning to do it forever and yay pandemic now is we can, we are, we all have to do it, right? We're all forced to do it, but I'm excited because one of the scariest things about pitching a game to a publisher is you send them the prototype and the rules and you're like, I, I didn't hire someone to edit my rules. Probably maybe you should, but often people don't. And like, what if they just completely, my rules weren't great. You know, the game is fun, but they misplayed it somehow or, the, I sent the video and they, they didn't watch the video. There's so many things that can go wrong when you're not having an in-person meeting. So being able to sit down with them on video, walk through it, you know, run the game, you know that it's being played correctly. And yeah, eventually, you know, if you get the contract signed, they're going to make a rules for it and it will be out there and people have to learn it without you sitting right there. But for the pitching process, I think it's so much better to be able to do a demo in person, even if it's digital, than relying on this kind of like, oh, they put the prototype in the closet and they forgot about it. You know, it's just so many things that can go wrong there. Um, as far as meeting publishers go, I've seen people definitely be more online, more active. So, uh, I've talked a lot about Twitter for more promotional stuff, but Facebook is great. That's where I have, I'm friends with a lot of the publishers, a lot of designers, a lot of reviewers, just Facebook friends with all these people. And I can kind of see what they're up to. Uh, a lot of people, you know, they're running games now. People like um, AEG is doing a weekly thing for tiny towns and they're bringing in a lot of designers there. So you can connect there or even participate, even this kind of chat, you know, I can see all the faces here. I've seen some new people that I haven't seen before. So people are connecting more. So there's definitely so ways to meet people. And for some people, it's even easier going to a convention and organically meeting someone and having a chat. That's not like, here's my cell sheet. You know, that's handing someone your cell sheet. You got to do it, but that's not how you build a relationship with someone bumping into someone at a party or at a restaurant, you know, at the, the bar, uh, wherever it is, just like hanging out and chatting after hours. That's where you really establish those relationships. And I think a lot of that is still possible in this new digital age. I think uh, Stronghold's also doing some chats as well. Yeah. Like so there's a, a ton of ways to, to get involved and to go for it. Yeah. Uh, were there any other last questions? Last minute questions. Lightning yeah. round. Um, I do agree that like now it might be even easier to get to publishers because like in the past, the um, best thing um, was to like uh, just volunteer, to actually like volunteer at somebody's booth and work with yeah. them. Um, and then like you get to know them and like if there's any downtime then you could be like oh yeah I also make games and this is my sell sheet and you know whatever you get to hang out with people um, that yeah. way but now you could do it from your home so uh, yeah it, it's a lot there's of definitely like a lot of uh, there's a lot of like different publishers that like they're still doing play testing like you can sign up to be part of the play testers of like uh, weird draft games or like a bunch of other companies and start just volunteering from your home and get to know them that way. And even just connecting with designers, like the Carla had posted the link to the Seattle Facebook, the group for the Seattle tabletop game designer Facebook group where that's opened up. Now, if you're a remote person, you can join that group. If you join the group, we have a discord too. 
uh, that we do for our weekly digital play testing, Anyone's Welcome. The New York City play testers also have a group um, we talked about on the most recent Ludology episode. There's links there too. Uh, and if you connect with other designers and they love your game, they, they'll they tell you. <laughs> they'll be like, oh my gosh, uh, like Stronghold, the AEG, uh, Game Right would love this game, you know. Maybe not, like we don't want to speak for publishers, but if I, I've played games recently where it's been for a contest, I'm like, Oh my gosh! If I, I chat with these publishers sometime, if they if they bring up that game, then I'll say like, oh yeah, I played that. That game is awesome. Uh, Catherine Stipple's new Against Gravity game. She's been posting online. I got to test that. I love that. I, I want to find a publisher for it, right? I'm like, I want to buy this game. You need to connect with a publisher. So even just making relationships with other designers can be super valuable. And with all the digital play testing that's going on now, it's easier than ever, and it's more accessible. I've had so many people come into the group and say, I live in Georgia, I live in Ohio, I don't have a local group. This is the first time they've been able to test regularly with people. And that's such an amazing thing to be able to get people in there who can't usually go to weekly events or go to conventions. So like with finding a publisher and getting a publisher to sign your game, I would say like most of the work is finding a publisher that is actually a fit for the game. Yeah. And having somebody say like, oh yeah, this would be a great game for this publisher that you didn't know, like that is fantastic. Um, yeah. Because like uh, there's there's a lot of great games out there and if you pitch me a great game that is just not a fit for my company, I won't sign it. Like because like, well, companies make products and they like, I mean, it has to be a product at the end of the day. So um, instead of like trying to approach every publisher that there is, it's actually like, it's probably better to like join the Seattle group and then get their feedback. Like uh, you, after somebody play test your game, you can be like, what, where do you think this would be a fit? And just, if you keep asking that enough, you'll eventually find like, oh yeah, this would be a fit with this company and you can go start making that connection. <laughs> That's honestly one of my favorite things. You talked about loving dinosaurs. Uh, late at night are like, you get a few industry people together and just goss gossiping about the thing. It's like, oh, who, who is so-and-so accepting pitches? I heard they were doing this and now they're doing this. They were kind of going for more casual games and now they're going for more complex games. Did you submit to that person? How did that go? How was your relationship with that person? How was working with them? You know, we just talked just the value, the gold of all that information for a newer person. Like for us who've been in the industry for a while, it's just totally normal. And, you know, we just pass this information back and forth. But if you're newer to the industry, just being a fly on the wall for those conversations is just, you just learn so much uh, about the ins and outs of making those connections. So um, it's now three o'clock. Um, it doesn't look like anyone had any last uh, questions or anything, but uh, thank you, Emma, for being here and showing or telling all your great um, information. And thank you all for watching and participating. Um, I really enjoy the fact that like there's a second conversation always going on in the chat. Um, so the next time we're doing this is Wednesday with the new random chats at uh, 7 p.m. CDT, um, but then Thursday will be the next uh, structured chat. Um, so yeah, um, thank you all for being here. Um, if you want to participate like outside these chats, uh, we have the Discord, which is linked, I feel like several times in there, um, but I can add the link again. So yeah, um, thank you for watching. Uh, Emma, if you have any of the last words. Thank you so much for having me. This was super fun, Carla. Like it's been fantastic just chatting with you here. Like this, this is the kind of thing we do at conventions, which is we can't really go to right now, but just this kind of, yes, it's about industry. Yes, it's about work, quote unquote, but it's also about connecting and me just liking you as a person and we're hanging out and hey, some people happen to be here learning some stuff too. So I think it's the best of all worlds. So uh, have a great weekend, everyone. All right. Bye. Thanks, Emma.